the Mariner's Museum in Newport News, Virginia. Summer hours for the museum are Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Saturday and Sunday are both 9 to 5. Sunday's listed as summer hours only, so that's liable to change in the wintertime. Admission for adults is around $20. Our primary goal for our visit today was to see the remains of the USS Monitor and the rest of the museum's ironclad display. On March 8, 1862, the CSS Virginia steamed into the mouth of Hampton Roads, Virginia, and for one day the Confederate Navy ruled the seas as the CSS Virginia sank two Union warships blockading the Confederate harbor. The CSS Virginia, sometimes referred to as the Merrimack, was ordered by the Confederates on July 11, 1861, and commissioned on February 17, 1862. The CSS Virginia superstructure was built atop the USS Merrimack's burned hull, which was burned on April 20, 1861, as Union forces evacuated Newport News. The Virginia was 275 feet long, had a complement of 320 officers and men, and had armor up to 4 inches thick. In response to the Confederate ironclad Virginia, the Union ordered the Monitor October 4, 1861, which was designed by Swedish-born engineer John Erickson. The USS Monitor was 179 feet long, 41 and a half feet wide, carried a crew of 49 officers and men, and had armor as thick as 8 inches on the gun turret. Despite having numerous patented inventions, the Monitor was made fun of and called Erickson's Folly and Cheese Box on a Raft or the Yankee cheese box. The main difference between the Monitor and the Virginia was the Virginia had to turn the entire ship to bring its guns to bear, where the Monitor only had to turn the turret to aim its two individual cannons. In spite of its revolutionary inventions, the Monitor was not without issues. Among some of the issues the Monitor had, one being the placement of the pilot house, which was the small square box placed on the bow of the ship, which was subject to both enemy and friendly fire. The Monitor also only had about 18 inches above the waterline, which in rough seas allowed water to spill in and come into ventilator shafts. The crew also complained about the unbearable heat inside the Monitor. On June 27th, some of the temperatures recorded inside the Monitor at 2 p.m. in the afternoon Engine room, 132 degrees. Turret, 115 degrees. And in the galley, 130 degrees. By 5 p.m. the same day, the temperature had risen in the engine room to 137 degrees. It took only 101 days to complete the monitor, which allowed her to steam to Hampton Roads, where she would meet the Virginia on March 9, 1862. The battle between the two ironclads effectively was a draw, although it was a strategic victory for the Union, and considered a tactical victory for the South. With the end of the battle, every other navy in the world was now obsolete. Considering both ships' groundbreaking achievements in design, both ironclads would meet a rather less glamorous fate. The CSS Virginia would be scuttled May 11, 1862, to prevent it from falling into the Union hands. On December 24, 1862, the Monitor received orders to steam south to Buford, North Carolina. While well suited for river combat, the Monitor's low freeboard and heavy turret made her rather unseaworthy in heavy seas. While under tow behind the USS Rhode Island, shortly before midnight December 30, 1862, Captain John Bankhead ordered the anchor of the monitor let go and all the chain given to her to help stabilize the monitor. Eventually the steam engines would be stopped and all available steam diverted to the Worthington pumps. A bucket brigade was even ordered, but all was for naught and the monitor would eventually be lost. The Monitor sank December 31, 1862, 16 miles southeast of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, along with 16 of her crew, two of which would be recovered in the turret when it was brought back to the surface. The anchor and its chain would be the first items recovered 400 feet off the starboard bow of the wreck in 1983. With the turret's recovery, the museum was able to make recreations of what the turret looked like when it was brought to the surface with the concretions on the outside, as well as what the turret looked like when it was new or as it was being constructed. During the sinking, the monitor capsized, rolling over, and during this process, the cannons inside the turret came loose from the carriages and fell up against the ceiling. The two crew members recovered from inside the turret were underneath of both of these cannons. The first crew member from the monitor's turret was removed during the recovery of the turret itself. The second crew member was removed when the turret was brought to the Mariner's Museum at Newport News. Of the 16 crew members of the USS Monitor, three crew members stood out as being the possibility of the two that were recovered from the turret. 
Jacob Nicholas, Robert Williams, or maybe William Bryan. Another decade would pass without the remains of the two crewmen being identified. The two unidentified sailors would eventually be buried at Arlington National Cemetery with full military honors. After studying the wreck, scientists believe that the ship sank stern first and landed on the sea floor, striking the stern on the sea bottom. This jarred the turret assembly loose from the deck of the ship, partially burying the turret in the sand. The spider assembly used to raise the monitor's turret would be lowered 230 feet down to the sea bottom, where the turret was secured inside the arms to be raised back to the surface. On August 5, 2002, after 41 days of work, the gun turret of the monitor broke the surface at 5.30 p.m. The spider assembly used to raise the gun turret of the monitor was placed on display in the center courtyard at the Mariner's Museum in Newport News. Several photographs and panoramic views inside the turret were taken to document the condition of the turret and the items that were brought to the surface. Remembering that the view inside the turret is still upside down since the turret still rests on its ceiling. Among the items found inside were the two gun port shutters that are still in the closed position blocking the ports. Also revealed in the excavations were two identical dents in the aft wall of the turret. These were likely caused by Chief Engineer Alan Stemmer before the monitor left New York. While testing Ericsson's specifically designed gun carriages, he accidentally loosened the friction brake gear. Upon firing the massive cannon, it recoiled into the turret wall, leaving a dent and almost crushing one of the crew members. A confused Stemmers, shaken but undeterred, repeated the mistake with the second gun carriage, causing an identical dent. The gun turret was placed in a large desalination tank used to remove the salt from the salt water that's impregnated the iron. The gun turret is still inside that desalination tank today. A large 10-foot section of deck plating was brought up from the wreck and specially treated so it can be touched and handled today by visitors. It's underneath of a large plexiglass protection with portions cut out where you can reach in and actually touch the plates that the sailors walked on over 150 years ago. The gun ports of the monitor were scalloped, which was as a result of a large drilling machine designed by Ericsson to drill vertical holes for the gun ports. It's not known if they were left that way intentionally or due to the rushed building of the ship to get it ready for battle. In later years, the gun ports would eventually be filed down smooth. Several of the crew quarters and different areas of the interior of the ship were recreated inside the museum to give you an idea of what the ship was like inside. To know what that noise was, everyone looked very innocent at the breakfast table this morning. The youngsters are full of tricks. Our letter bag is being made up, so I must say goodbye once more. Good night, and my best kiss to yourself and the dear children. With them. This small brass lantern was one of the items that was recovered from inside the gun turret. 
and was most likely used to help illuminate the inside of the turret when it was dark outside. The wooden drawer was also recovered inside the gun turret and it is believed that the drawer ended up in the turret when the ship rolled over. The first sailor recovered out of the gun turret was found wearing two different style shoes. It's not known why he had two different shoes, but possibly during the chaos of the sinking, he grabbed the first ones he could find to make his way out. The engine register is like an odometer in a vehicle, and it counts the number of revolutions the propeller shaft makes, and it was the first item recovered out of the monitor that had the name of the ship imprinted on it. The head, or the bathroom, on the USS Monitor was designed with two levers and a port leading to the outside of the ship below the waterline. And it was the same design that was used all the way up into World War II on submarines. Daniel Logue, acting assistant surgeon on the USS Monitor, got a surprise one day when he tried to use the head, having neglected to operate the levers in the correct sequence. When he finished, he accidentally turned the head into a fountain by pulling the wrong lever. There's a small model inside the museum of the steam engine designed by Ericsson. The engines were designed specially for the monitor so they would fit in the cramped quarters under the deck. 